on the morning of March 8, 2024, United Airlines Flight 2477, a Boeing 737 MAX, was making what should have been a routine arrival into Houston's George Bush Intercontinental Airport. The flight from Memphis carried 160 passengers and six crew. Nothing about the approach hinted at trouble, but it fell into what I'll call the BB gun versus 22 trap. And about of good luck, there were no injuries among the 166 people on board. The damage was limited to embarrassment and millions of dollars in write-offs. Events like this rarely linger in the fast churn of national news, yet they represent one of the most common categories of airline accidents, runway excursions. And while this one was relatively benign, sometimes they kill a kid, as happened with Southwest Airlines Flight 1248 just before Christmas in 2005. From a pilot's perspective, that's what makes this outcome doubly tragic. These accidents are almost always controllable and almost always a pilot's fault. Now for the pilots out there, this is a valuable case study in how small decisions can carry big consequences. And for everyone else, it's a rare look into the constant, often invisible risk management your flight crews perform every day to keep the metal on the pavement and to get you to the gate without any drama. I'm Stan, welcome to Flying for Money. We've got a few details to cover before we get to the accident itself. If you're short on time, here's a time code to skip ahead. As part of the investigative process, the NTSB invited several qualified parties to participate, including the FAA, United Airlines, Boeing, and the Airline Pilots Association. That lineup often raises eyebrows. Over the past 15 years, I've covered hundreds of aviation accidents for Flying Magazine, Twin and Turbine, Redbird Flight Simulators, and this channel. And one question comes up again and again. Why is the aircraft manufacturer involved in investigating its own airplane? That skepticism gets sharp in international accidents, even conspiratorial. Air India 171 is a good example, where the absence of reasons to blame Boeing has prompted claims that investigators are capitulating to American interests. This ignores a few basic realities that are worth understanding. First, there is no organization on earth with deeper technical knowledge of a modern airliner than the manufacturer. They designed it and they employ the engineers. Designing a transport category jet is a multi-billion dollar undertaking. Creating a fully independent body with equivalent expertise across a global fleet would require tens of billions of dollars and still wouldn't match the institutional knowledge manufacturers already possess. So investigators consult the plane builders. It's faster, it's cheaper, and practically speaking, it's unavoidable. The entire purpose of accident investigations is prevention. Blame doesn't increase safety, it just reduces cooperation. But civil litigation is built on blame, and everyone involved at some point ends up under that shadow. This leads into a particular oddity in this accident that I've never encountered before. Because it took time to get air stairs in place after the incident, the cockpit voice recorder captured extended post-incident audio, including a phone call to an Airline Pilots Association representative. Gotta call Alpha. Go. Yeah, listen, I just ran off the end of runway 27. You did it just now? Yeah, we're sitting here in the airplane. Left main gear collapsed, and we're deplaning right now to the buses. Okay, don't say another word in the airplane. Okay, all right. Following that call, the CVR recorded radio traffic about the deplaning process and coordination with flight attendants assisting a wheelchair passenger. The Alpa Central Air Safety Chair advised the crew to complete the evacuation checklist and then direct the flight attendants to assemble away from potential bystander video. We're sitting both in the cockpit right now. Okay, door closed. Doors closed. The APU's off because the flight attendants told us there was a fuel leak. We're on the emergency power. Hey guys, just so you know who I am, I'm the Central Air Safety Committee Chair for ALPA. Just gotta let you know, just take a deep breath. It's okay, relax. Things like this happen. Not a good week for United. We just lost a tire going through the uh, parking lot, so things like this happen. So go through your procedures. Make sure you cover all your items. Follow your evacuation checklist. All right, that's done. Okay, so now, now you just secured everything. You're done at that point. Um, you guys should now start to gather your, I want you to have a plan. You're going to travel, uh, you're going to write to the chief pilot's office. You're not doing anything else. You're not talking to anybody, and uh, that's, that's it. You just, you're going to go down there. They're probably going to make you do a drug and alcohol test, right? That's standard. Yeah. Okay, they're going to ask you questions. Your response is going to be very clearly, I'm a little rattled right now. Um, let me gather my thoughts, and, uh, and we'll follow the appropriate reports in due time. Okay. 
I don't want, I don't want you guys saying anything right now. Catch your breath. But he says, hers intact. Everything's going to be fine. This will be a flight safety investigation. You're going to file FSAPs. You're going to be completely protected. I cannot, I cannot stress this enough to you. Okay. You will be completely protected, and after about a month, you'll go back and fly the line again, and, and this will be over and done with, okay? Okay. Okay, I, uh, but I understand this kind of, uh, this big deal right now for you guys. Yeah, the only other thing, the only other thing, I really don't want to board the bus with the passengers, so i got to figure out a way how to get to the terminal. Okay, what I want you to do is to call maintenance on another line uh -huh. and send, tell them to send a truck or a vehicle out there to take you and the first officer to uh, terminal to the chief pilot's office. It may all be framed as safety, but investigations inevitably resemble a multi-party dispute. The manufacturer accuses airline practices, the airline throws shade at design faults, the union focuses on the pilot's livelihood. Each party filters facts through its own institutional lens. The line between blame and safety enhancing explanation is not always clean. It's sausage making with the NTSB as an intermediator. In non-fatal accidents like this one, the spotlight is much less bright. But when the body count rises, investigations can become political. Safety competing with national interests, blame sharpened to satisfy public outrage, and diplomatic considerations influencing how findings are ultimately expressed. This brings me to my next video, where I'll dig into several mass casualty accidents in which pilot actions were intentionally concealed or reframed. Somehow, we become so compassionate that when a pilot intentionally attempts to crash an airplane, we hesitate to condemn him as a mass murderer. In some cases, we don't even acknowledge the obvious as suicide. That process national pride defeating common sense, creates an environment where a homicidal pilot can destroy countless lives without ever suffering the indignity of condemnation. It may be unfolding again in the Air India 171 investigation, and it has arguably contributed to hundreds of airline deaths. If you want to see how deep that rabbit hole goes, subscribe and hit the bell. There's one last comparison I want to make. It's a bit unusual, but if you stay with me, it explains the dilemma the public, and even many professional pilots, rarely consider. In aviation, extremely small margins leverage extremely high levels of safety. I'm borrowing an idea from Veritasium. I am terrible at making clickbait. Up until two years ago, my most popular video was about a basketball being dropped from a dam with a bit of backspin. This video was embedded on literally hundreds of news websites. It got 16.3 million views but almost none of those views came on the YouTube platform. Why? Because I gave it this thumbnail and I called it strange applications of the Magnus effect. Someone else re-uploaded the video with the clever title, Basketball Dropped From Dam. And within a few weeks, that video had received tens of millions of views on YouTube. Now here is where you would find strange applications of the Magnus effect. Now in the middle is where you would find type one clickbait. Instead of type one clickbait, my friend and YouTuber Brady Heron suggested legit bait. Each video could have hundreds or thousands of different legit bait titles. Now the most enticing titles and thumbnails are found close to type two clickbait. But remember that everyone's definition of clickbait is different and everyone's perceptions of words and images are different. So these are not clear boundaries. They're actually kind of fuzzy. Aviation operates on a similar boundary, except the trade-off isn't clicks. It's safety versus efficiency. More safety means bigger margins. Bigger margins mean more weight. More weight means more fuel, more drag, and more cost. And while passengers value safety, cheap tickets are immediate and transparent in a way that safety isn't. That pulls the economic center of gravity towards a fuzzy edge because that's where return on investment lives. Push too far and the consequences can last decades. The early 737 MAX accidents are a reminder of the catastrophic effect on trust that a miscalculation can have and why manufacturers and airlines genuinely want to get that balance right. Now for its part, United Airlines had access to several optional safety features on the 737 designed to reduce runway excursions. RSAT, ORW, RAS, and Perspective Runway. That last system, requiring a heads-up display, shows where the aircraft will stop if current deceleration rates are maintained. That information could have prevented this accident. It could have saved the five-year-old killed in 2005 had it existed then. Collins Aerospace reports that roughly 80% of delivered 737s are equipped with a HUD. 
United is among the few operators that declined it. In September 2025, United told the NTSB it was in final review to retrofit 564 aircraft with the devices. The handoff of responsibility from manufacturer and airline to pilot is abrupt and critical. Aircraft operate in a kinetic environment with trillions of possible permutations on every flight. Training focuses on the center of that bell curve. The extreme edges are left to human judgment. Manufacturers design the airplane, but they hand daily decisions to the pilots through procedures, switches, and controls. The combinations are so vast that no software could ever cover more than a fraction of the possible outcomes. That's why judgment matters and why pilot error appears so frequently in accident statistics. Here's the uncomfortable truth. Some risks are accepted intentionally. Flying in the snow, rain, gusty winds, slick runways, mountainous terrain, or frankly anything involving LaGuardia or Reagan National means trading margin for efficiency or access. Most of the time, that trade-off is justified. Sometimes it isn't. And in this case, that boundary is exactly where things began to unravel. The approach itself was uneventful. The captain, a highly experienced 737 pilot with more than 15,000 hours on type, was flying. Weather was marginal but within limits. The crew requested runway 27 to shorten taxi time. The captain asked to expedite to the end of the runway. Houston Tower, good morning. United 2477, ILS 27. United 2477, clear to land. Clear to land, 27, United 2477. Tower, United 2477. United 2477, Tower. How's our spacing looking? Can we roll it all the way to the end? Speed up, that's true. Okay, United 2477, we'll do. Check the ramp, good day. Here, Charlie, ramp, United 2477, great weekend. United 2477, uh, correction to United 1383, go around. Later, he told the NTSB that Tower's instruction to keep your speed up contributed to the excessive speed he maintained as runway distance diminished. That instruction and the desire to comply with it became the first unnecessary crack in the chain. A CRJ ahead of United 2477 exited earlier and turned towards a ramp just before United came into view. Had United followed the same profile, they likely would have reached the gate at about the same time that their engines reached the recommended three-minute cool-down period. ATIS broadcast wet, slippery runway conditions. The captain later recalled the runway appearing dry after breaking out of the clouds. The first officer, on the other hand, recalled it looking wet. Touchdown occurred about 1,000 feet past the threshold at roughly 150 knots, a solid landing. Spoilers deployed, everything was normal, then it unraveled. Idle reverse was selected despite higher levels being available. On a runway defined as slippery when wet, even one 10,000 feet long, maximum reverse is often appropriate when there's any doubt, and United policy reflects that. If you leave the pavement without max reverse, you've done something wrong. Five seconds after touchdown at 140 knots, the captain manually stowed the speed brake, disabling the auto brakes, which were already set to the lowest level. From that moment on, stopping depended entirely on manual braking. After RAS announced 2,000 feet remaining, the FO made the 80 knot call and saw the reverser stowed, likely reflexive, but critically wrong. With runway disappearing, max reverse to a stop was the right move. At 1,000 feet remaining, the captain pressed harder on the brakes. Deceleration wasn't what he expected. With little pavement left, he chose to dive onto taxiway Sierra Charlie rather than continue straight. Braking aggressively while turning sharply at nearly 40 knots, the aircraft shuddered violently, a classic signature of max braking on a wet surface with limited directional control. The jet slid off the pavement. The left main gear struck a recessed electrical junction box and separated exactly as designed, shearing at the fuse pins to protect the wing. The aircraft came to rest partially on grass. Despite substantial damage, there were no injuries. Slides were not deployed. The right call after a wrong one. Evacuations almost always injure someone, infant or elderly. Air stairs were used instead, and all passengers deplaned safely. The cockpit door stayed closed until deplaning was complete. You can't blame the captain for that. There was nothing to gain from 160 accusatory stares. God darn it, I'm so sorry. All right. So we need to ask them if they have any issues back there. I'm in deep shit. Uh, folks, uh, I do apologize. Uh, we ran off the uh, runway here and 
Well, I've made years in the grass, so we're waiting for operations at the airport to come and inspect, and then decide what we're going to do uh, outside. So stay seated with your seatbelts fastened. Thank you. I can't believe I did this. Sorry, man, to get you into this mess. That's yeah. Should have done uh, auto brakes three or two and four reverse. Well, wrong way too. I didn't even consider that. Well, I'm gonna be freaking. We're talking about violation. I'm gonna be freaking written up for not doing max or auto brake too. Oh yeah. For the wet runway, not doing for us first or max. All kinds of shit that I always, I always knew about that stuff. I thought I was gonna stop, dude. I'm so freaking sorry to get you into this. I'm so sorry. You wanna? Um, I'm kind of looking at the uh, parking checklist here. The captain's anxiety captured on the CVR was well founded. United's manual requires auto brakes at three or max on a 333 runway, and it requires max reverse thrust as a standard following all landings. That brings me back to the BB gun versus 22 dilemma. As a kid in Cub Scouts, we got an hour long safety briefing before shooting BB guns at a range. A year later, with 22 rifles, it only took five minutes. The reason was obvious. Everyone knew the stakes. Give kids BB guns and they'll shoot each other in the ass. Hand them a 22 and tell them to keep it down range, and they do it. A 737 Max at 150,000 pounds needs about 5,000 feet on a dry runway, and that's with margins built in. On shorter or slick runways, those margins shrink, and behavior changes to compensate. A pilot landing on a 6,500 foot wet runway treats it like a kid with a 22. Give that same pilot a 10,000 foot runway and suddenly he's flagging the room with that deadly instrument. Here's a math. Without spoilers, landing on a 333 runway requires about 9,100 feet. That's some pucker factor on a 10,000 foot runway. Remove effective reverse and it climbs to 11,500. Add anti-skid degradation and you're approaching 16,000. By contrast, a properly configured landing needs about 7,800 feet under similar runway conditions. The NTSB tested 29 deceleration combinations. 24 would have stopped the aircraft safely. Intentionally reducing braking is common for comfort, wear, or taxi time. On a dry runway, it's often defensible. On a wet runway defined as slippery, that trade moves firmly into the unacceptable side of the curve. Because safety isn't a switch, it's a reserve, a bank account and every decision either preserves it or spends it. On this flight, the account was drawn down faster than expected until the crew found themselves bankrupt and in the mud. Good. Okay, vehicle off the runway, runway 27 closed. Everybody's got to go around. Closed. Yep. Two seven runway 27 closed. Yep. Not a kid's eyes. Let's use the tower with the emergency. We have aircraft, United 1427, in the grass off the departure end of runway 27. Thanks for watching. If you want more from me on a different subject, life, death, and what comes next, select the video card on the screen for my other channel, God of Game Theory. See you next time and stay safe.